Well, um, Ken, Ken's going to be just a, a few minutes late, so I'm, I'm going I'm to start us off. Um, so welcome again to uh, this month's uh, Winchester NAC meeting. Um, thanks, for, thanks for taking time on, on Wednesday night. Um, I'm going to start with just introductions. Uh, my name is Kurt Vartan. I'm the president of this group. Uh, we have Ken Pyle, who's not here at this moment, but he will be here in a moment. He had to take care of something with his son, uh, but he'll be here momentarily. And uh, as soon as he comes in, we'll just take a quick uh, uh, intro to him just to make sure you know who he is. Um, uh, Secretary Daphne Wolf is right over here. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Barbara Moore, great right here. is our treasurer. And um, we soon to uh, have Steve Landau as the past president board member. And Steve is right here. It's, uh, it's okay, we have to go. Oh, let me change and do one last thing. Well, do they need the light on? Can you guys see this okay? Yeah. Is that better? Oh, that's, that's better, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and when Jim gets up, we'll turn it back on because he doesn't have any slides. This is just to keep, just so you can see the kind of the flow we have here. Um, so this is our, our agenda. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, go through this. Again, Jim is our guest speaker. Jim, where are you? Jim, right? Christina, thank you, uh, with Chappie's office. Uh, welcome. Uh, our, our council member, District 1, uh, well, the District 1 council office. I'm actually technically in District 6, so I can't say our, but I mean our this group, um, uh, district office. Um, okay, so we're going to uh, see if there's any, uh, any other items that are not on this list that we want to add to this list. Do you want to talk about tonight? If anything comes up, just kind of take a minute. So the first thing under under uh, business, I didn't have a placeholder slide, is to approve minutes from the prior meeting, and which also includes the treasurer report. Are there any issues with the meetings that we sent out uh, a couple weeks ago? No, great. So we're going to assume those approved. Uh, motion to uh, approve the minutes. Great. Any any uh, second? Great. All in favor? Aye. Any issues? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, the. Uh, Information, I don't have it on, on this, uh, this slide, but we do have a new email address that works. If you want to hit all the board members, if you send to info at winchesternac.com, that comes to uh, me, Ken, Daphna, Steve, and Barbara.
if you remember, it was kind of a tongue twister uh, last time. We got some feedback about what it should. Oh, so this is Pierre Luigi Oliverio. Uh, he's our District 6 Council member. Welcome, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Hey. Um, our, um, the, uh, the, we took a shot at the agenda I mean, of, the, of the vision, and we, we, we think this captures the essence of, of, what we, of what we want to try and accomplish. And I'll just read it out loud. To ensure quality of life and economic development in the Winchester region through innovation and vision. It's pretty, it, it, it allows for some flexibility, but it captures the essence. We, we believe it captures the essence of what we're trying to do here, which is how can we improve our quality of life with the, with the, in the spirit of technology and with a forethought of where we're headed. What, what do you guys think about that?
next tab is agendas and meetings. Uh, agendas and meeting minutes. So here's tonight's meeting. This is the agenda that was here uh, last last week, uh, last month. Our board meeting notes. If you want to see that, we'll put the meeting minutes from this. Will also be put up there. Again, we want to try and be as transparent about what we do and how we get to where we are um, as possible. So that's what the that's what that area does. Uh, next one is uh, there's a useful link which I didn't spend uh, any time on, but the last one is the videos. So these are the two speakers that we've had, or um, one speaker and, and one uh, speaker that was at a, a different meeting, but we wanted to capture. Uh, the first one was we had the from personal assistant to personal chauffeur. That was um, Alan and um, I think her name was Sharon Barbara Sharon Sharon. Anyway, it was two two great two really good speakers um, that came together. In our
and City Council uh, unanimously adopted the Council Policy 4-2. And it actually did two things more than just um, propose and have our council support and actually have staff implement LED lighting. It actually did not use the word LED lighting. It used the word solid state lighting. And that was a future-proof statement so that whenever something took the place of LED someday, we would be prepared to move in without going to council and busting that policy up. The second thing the policy did was it didn't just refer to uh, solid state lighting. It mandated that they had to be network controlled. They could not be put up in a dumb, static fashion without uh, having some type of wireless or wired communications to the streetlights. It was our vision in 2008 that we should operate the streetlight system like we operate uh, water systems, uh, traffic signal systems, other transportation or utility systems. We needed to be able to monitor and detect outages, uh, dim, brighten, flash, turn off, Police department wanted to have them all off for uh, dealing with a crime scene, for instance. So that was the second thing unique about this policy. It's the only policy in the United States that I know of that mandates the city go to network lighting. That's one reason why San Jose is not as far along as some cities all around us that have converted to LED lighting. And in a sense, I feel sorry for them because those lights will be in there for 15 to 20 years and they will never be able to communicate to them monitor them change uh, change uh, lighting levels because they didn't put in the network. So we're a little behind in implementation, meaning the city of San Jose is, but probably for good reason. The third thing that I think is really cool about that is a very it's in the policy that the goal is by 2022, not only will the entire city be converted to solid state smart controlled lighting, but that they will be net energy zero efficient meaning that they should be burning as little electricity as possible to get the job done to achieve your vision both quality of life economic development uh, sustainability but at the same time there should be enough alternative power produced uh, near those lights or at other locations so that the power consumed by the lights can be offset by the power uh, produced by alternative energy and it would it would not necessarily feed each light, but there would be a net zero in terms of energy consumption. Because it, when you think of solar, you're collecting a lot of energy during the day. You can sell it back to the utility companies at peak times and then use low-cost energy at night to operate your lights. And the, the difference in cost, the goal in that policy says it should be zero. So that's one thing I think that's quite interesting about this policy versus any other cities in the United States. Um, I wanted to um, just recognize Pierre Luigi Oliverio, who I worked with for several years while I was still with San Jose. And um, also I worked with Trixie, um, Linda, Pete, but not Chappie. But I just met the staff. It's great meeting you both. I know District 1 and District 6 both have, you know, contiguous borders through here. And I worked with Steve Landau and Richard and Betty Kabanek uh, back when they, I think Richard was president. Uh, I worked with them on traffic calming issues on Eden Avenue, Cypress, Phelps, you name it. <laughs> uh, been in this building many times. I thought I was going away and hiding after I retired in 09, but I'm, I've been consulting and I consult for Samsung Technology as one of my clients, as does Steve Landau. And we were in that nice new building on North First Street, bumping into each other, going to meetings with Samsung, and he said, you, you know, this is cool stuff you're doing with Samsung on technology um, and other companies on uh, lighting and traffic technologies. You ought to come and share with our, our neighborhood uh, association really what's, what you know that's going on happening in the future and how it might apply to uh, San Jose or other local cities uh, at the neighborhood or arterial levels. Uh, so that's why I'm here tonight. So it's a real honor, Steve, and thanks for the invitation. Um, let's start maybe with uh, some of the things that we did in uh, San Jose when I was there that um, steered me into my consulting life. One of the things was uh, 
company in Campbell named ChargePoint. Back then, their name was Coulomb. They came to the mayor, Chuck Reed, city manager, and into my office with a dream to install the nation's first electric vehicle public charging station. None of us knew really what that meant. There weren't any electric vehicles on the road. Tesla was not out. Um, but our department uh, saw that as an opportunity to be the first in the nation to uh, put the egg in before the chicken, maybe. <laughs> Whatever you want to think, however you want to think about it, um, we did install the nation's first electric vehicle charging stations in the downtown area, both on city streets, in public parking lots, and actually one in front of a school uh, where our um, school vehicles and staff vehicles could charge, charge their vehicles uh, and use clean air vehicles in front of schools. Um, what was unique about some of those downtown was they were on street light poles. We saw the opportunity to uh, not drill another hole in the sidewalk. We saw that street light poles have electrical circuits inside of them, and they have a lot of heavy metal around them, and they're conveniently located right alongside of the curb. So the street light, uh, the charging stations that we first installed were on street light poles. The problem uh, that was great. The problem with that was uh, we were not uh, authorized or allowed to use the electricity wires that were in those poles because that is dedicated for lighting. And we'll talk a little bit uh, later tonight um, how we got around that. We actually had to pull new wires alongside of the other wires and uh, put in an, an additional PGE meter uh, uh, to read the electrical loads that go through those um, charging cords that go into the car. So it's on a pole, looks like it's using electric wires from the poles, but it's not. Um, one smart thing I think that happened with that first pole that went in, we put every 20 feet a pole box near uh, all the way down the street, and today there's three charging stations on Santa Clara Street across the street from City Hall where there used to be one, and there's room for three or four more. And so that, that was planning for the future as more car, cars uh, are electrified. The other thing we did, and this was through Steve, back when he worked for Phillips Lumilet, uh, he and I met in 2006, and Steve was quite impressed with our use of LED uh, traffic signal lights. We were one of the first cities in the nation to convert most of our traffic signal heads to LEDs. And because Phillips Lumilet, a San Jose company, I might add, was so um, focused on the future of LEDs, Steve asked if I would come to San Diego and make a presentation on everything that San Jose is doing and wants to do with LED um, technology. And that is when I learned or actually had a vision and, and spoke to the fact that someday, beyond 2006, LED technology would be able to light our streets. And sure enough, um, I met uh, the um, vice president of Cree Lighting and all of you have probably purchased a Cree LED, LED bulb for your living room by now. Uh, but Cree had not installed any LED streetlights in the West Coast, only in their home state at this point. And I asked if uh, they would like to install some in San Jose. They agreed. So we installed the first outdoor public LED lights in the West Coast. And those are in downtown in a little parking lot off the ball back next to the convention center. And they're still working. <laughs> um, but what, what that really proved to us was LED lighting was coming, and that kind of spurred the development of that policy. So after I retired in 2009, I had a real focus and attention uh, to uh, start my own consulting business and help cities and public Structures come together with the private sector and create innovative and sustainable solutions both in lighting and transportation. And uh, ever since then, I've been having a great time working on electric vehicle issues and primarily uh, LED lighting issues and Internet of Things. Um, you're not too interested in electric vehicles tonight, but I, but because of the work that San Jose did. I was able to author Sonoma County's electric vehicle policy that dictated how they would install electric charging stations throughout the county. I worked on 
the state of Washington's uh, master plan, the state of Hawaii's master plan, the state of Pennsylvania's master plan, and also uh, co-authored a document called Ready, Set, Charge California by our local Bay Area Climate Collaborative right here. So that's been great. Uh, all of that in four or five years um, has been tremendous. In the area of lighting, I'm not really I guess satisfied with just seeing cities going to static level LED lighting. I want to see lighting meet the Internet of Things. And I think talking to Steve and a little bit to Kirk, that's some of your ambitions too. Why is it that our lights are so limited? Why, why when we um, install new lights, can't we do more with them? Uh, and the question, when you think about it, what what device in the city is on all? every street, evenly spaced, has electricity, has the best real estate over any crosswalk looking down, can see a, a bicycle, a pedestrian, or a vehicle traveling due to its vantage point. And uh, when you think about it, there is really nothing else that compares to the opportunity to utilize streetlights in a more effective manner than they're used today across the nation. And so what prevents us from vaulting forward and working with lighting companies and companies like Samsung, Cisco, and um, you name it, there's a host of companies that want to get their fingers on our streetlights. And it's, it's very difficult, and I'll try to give you the snapshot reason why. Um, <clears throat> know what an investor-owned utility is? So what, what would that be? Uh, um, PG&E. PG&E. <laughs> and why is it called an investor-owned utility? Well, because investors own their stock and don't really it's, have control. That's right. It's, it's actually got a board of directors and it's, it's on public trading and it's, a, it's based, it's a profit motivated uh, company like any other corporation. But it has the right to the, ter the pg e territory in Northern California is about 13 million accounts. And, but it is investor-owned. And how many investor-owned utilities do you think there might be in California? Three? Three is right. <laughs> San Diego, Southern California, pg e so San Diego, Southern California, and pg e And they're all three investor-owned utilities, and they have the lion's share is water uh, throughout the uh, state of California. What's a municipally municipally owned utility? Oh, the city of Santa Clara. Uh, Santa Clara Power and Light is a municipally owned and operated utility. Who sets policy at Santa Clara's utility company? Council. The mayor and the council. Who sets policy at the investor owned utilities? It's a combination. The board of directors The CPUC is the parent regulatory agency that oversees tariffs, bills, rate structures. Every time you get a rate increase, the CPUC, a five-member board appointed by the governor, has at some point approved that change. Streetlights, for the most part, are not metered in California. There is no electric meter. Um, they run on electricity that has a photo cell on street light or on the uh, first pole affecting all the 14 lights on that circuit. And that photo cell is presumed to uh, come on at dark and presumed to go off at daylight because it is built to uh, go it is built to measure the ambient light around it and it, it should have in fact burned in this part of California about 11 to 11 and a half hours every day for the whole year. So some nights 10 hours, some nights 12 hours, but on the average about 11 hours. And that's, that's all controlled by a photo cell. And uh, the utility companies are quite happy with that arrangement because um, a, a good city might have 95% of its lights functioning and working at any time. 
during staff shortages, as uh, our council members and staff assistants for council members will attest, we can have sometimes 10% of our lights not burning. But since there's no meter and we are not given uh, outage reports very efficiently by the community or by our police department or by community service officers or by staff, um, the light stays out for weeks. Yet we continue to pay the bill. So, in essence, the uh, utility companies are quite happy with getting a nice fat paycheck every month whether a light is working or not. Uh, another problem with old technologies like photocells is that if you have a bird that's sitting on one or has left some remains on one, that photocell now thinks it's dark. <laughs> and if it thinks it's dark, that means it's burning all day. So in those rare, some rare cases, the utility company gets, they lose a little money on this. But we don't like lights to burn during the day. It's not a, a very attractive thing to have happen. Um, photo cells accounted for about um, uh, close to 20% of our malfunctions in the city of San Jose. Um, so 62,000 lights, 13,000 malfunctions a year. Um, about 20% of the malfunctions were photocell related. Either a tree in the wind was blowing and hit the photocell, snapped it off, and that was a, a call for action. Or the photocell was full of dirt, dust, lint, whatever. It was on all the time. Or it just broke and then the light wouldn't come on. So photocells, uh, I've always considered, are the weakest link in the chain of a streetlight system. Investor-owned utilities um, tariffs. A tariff is a, a bill. It's a schedule. Uh, at home, your your electric bill is based upon a certain schedule that CPUC is approved. Well, there's schedules for streetlights too, and the most common one is called the LS2 schedule. That means it's a public. City that power is purchased from the utility. So that if you ever Google PG&E, go to LS2 schedule and you can read all about streetlights. But I'll, I'll just give you a couple words out of PG&E schedule. Photo, photo controls. This rate schedule is predicated on an electric type photo controls meeting ANSI standard 136.1. It's a, it's a standard photo cell that every city has to use. The problem with that photo cell is that standard is three times removed from the current ANSI standard photo cell. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the oldest uh, photo cell standards there is, and uh, uh, we would be wise to have the CPUC direct the industrial and utilities to at least go to a 146.1, not a 136.1. Instead of having just three electrical wires, a hot, a neutral, and a negative, um, you get up to seven wires where you can have hot, neutral, negative, two more for inbound communications, two more for outbound com communications, and pretty soon you have a photo cell that's very smart, and it's uh, uh, you're able to talk to it through uh, uh, Wi-Fi or cell phones and things like that. So, so first off, they mandate every streetlight in a Secondly is any load other than the lighting load is a non-conforming load. A load is pulling power. Um, some exception, exceptions for limited loads may be granted by a separate agreement. So can you imagine if the city wants to put um, a speed display sign in a school zone that says your speed is... they go through the onerous process of doing a separate agreement with the utility company, which in itself could take who knows how long. Um, so you all have meters at home. You either have a 60 amp meter uh, uh, panel in an old home or a 100 amp panel or a 200 amp panel. And isn't it nice that once you've passed that panel, you have all these circuits 
fruits in your house. And you, as customers, can determine to do your load of laundry at night or on Saturdays. You can uh, put dimmers on every light in your house to go off when they're not needed. You can buy new appliances that are Energy Star related. As a matter of fact, with smart meters and technology that PG&E has mandated on every one of your homes, called a smart meter, um, you can monitor your bill and really become quite smart on how to save a lot of money. Cities and their streetlights, they're just not afforded that, that freedom. They can't monitor their lights. They can't change the loads. And even if they did, this old photo cell, um, the tariffs need updating. And I'm pleased to say, I think I'm right on this, but council, city council last week uh, made it a new legislative priority. Is that possibly accurate statement? New legislative priority to San Jose City Council to have the state work on legislation that will change the picture there. So that's good. Is it state legislation that's required? Or is it? Well, unfortunately, it might have to go that high to work all the way back down to the CPUC and the utilities. But <clears throat> San Jose is the only city in the state that in 2011 got a waiver to put in smart meters on some street lights and do it by pilot. We're the only city in this whole, whole state that has uh, under investor owned utilities that has that waiver. Um, and that is why you're seeing some limited testing of new technologies on San Jose streetlights, but we all know there's much more that can be done. But I must say that our hands are tied right now at the municipal, county, and special district um, levels. Jim, how, how, how can we, I mean, is there anything we can do to affect, do we, do we write our council members, do we write the governor, do we write the board members, I mean, do we start to open meetings, mm -hmm. what do we do? Well, I think just be true to your vision, um, you know, you just align your actions with your vision as it relates to your desire to um, put in um, devices, whether they're lighting or transport security camera in a, in a bad area or something, but Traffic just aligning, aligning to your vision that, you know, you really support smarter use of uh, um, transportation and lighting electrical systems. Because everything I've just said about streetlights, it's, it's not too far different with traffic signals. Sixty-two thousand streetlights, but only uh, about a thousand traffic signals. So they're spread out much more. But at the same time, it's very limiting what we can do in a traffic signal by putting more internet technology devices in that intersection. Just, just by way of example, traffic signals used to use a fifty-amp circuit breaker. That's a lot. And the reason was there's up to 70 light bulbs that were burning. Not all at once, but going back and forth. Green, yellow, red, all around an intersection. All the pedestrian walk signals. All the other electrical load. Today, with the uh, conversion to very, very low wattage LED lights, uh, less than five watts is being burned. Um, the power bill, uh, the consumption of kilowatt hours San Jose, before we converted to LED traffic signal heads, was 16 million kilowatt hours per year. It dropped to 1.6 million kilowatt hours. The power bill used to be 2 million. It's very low now. Utility companies lost a lot of money when cities went to LED traffic signal heads because every traffic signal is metered. Not like streetlights. And I'll just close on but the language in the tariff, in the TC-1 tariff, still states that no city shall add any additional load greater than 5% of the traffic signal load. So if you think about it, we have circuitry that was designed for 50 amps. We're using 5 amps, but we can't add more than 5% to 5. <laughs> and that's it, right? And, but you could, by agreement, if you want to do a one-off case, one at a 
time. So in my view, it might be short-sighted, but I think utility companies should be in the city in the business of selling electricity. And right now, the way things are going for them, with every solar panel that goes in and every alternative energy and every new efficiency device that is built, um, they're kind of in a downward spiral, spiral in my mind. And if I were, I think, trying to give a message, it would be to encourage utility companies to sell electricity to cities. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't have to put solar panels on every little device on our city streets. It's faster, but it, but it also costs maybe $600 more to buy that device, and then you have battery issues. And, um, it would be nice just to use the electricity, pay your fair share, pg and happy, we're happy. Everybody's. Your vision is good. See? So it's, it's clear from what you're telling us that we've got a, a roadblock in pg and yes. in this area. And your, and your city knows that. Right. If we can get by that, can you talk a bit about the technologies that you're seeing other cities implement or the things that we could be looking at and recognize for most of us here, we have a real focus on traffic-oriented issues. And yeah. yeah. And so, traffic surveys. Traffic is one technology. And sir, you had a point you wanted to make? Yeah, you compared, uh, you said that there was a 2 p.m. circuit for the traffic thing, and then you said, well, the LEDs only use five Watts, you're comparing the apples and oranges there. Yeah, yeah. So what how much what's the actual load of the traffic signal yeah. with LEDs? Good point. I I, I misspoke. The the incandescent bulbs were 150 watts. Okay. And now they're five watts. So every bulb out there is about five watts now versus 150 watts. Some of the bulbs were only 70 watts because they were smaller indicators. But on the average just a tremendous, like over 90% of the energy was saved. So the amperage went from 50 amps down to about 5 amps. That's, that's how much is being used. But the old 50 amp breaker is still there. All the wires are to number 12, 14 gauge for all this heavy stuff going on. But it's not happening. And you said those are all meters, right? Every one of those is meters, yes. Okay, so um, <clears throat> time is short, so the city manager's office wrote um, a memo to the council on December 16th about the smart pilot, streetlight pilots going on in San Jose. And I've sent an electronic copy to Kirk, and I encourage him just to forward it if he hasn't already to all of you. But there is a paragraph that I'll read out of the four pages, just one paragraph. Um, one of the ongoing challenges is that pg and current tariff structure does not allow for widespread adoption of these smart meters. Staff is recommending a new legislative priority as part of the December 15th discussion at council that would focus on legislative and regulatory change to allow immediate adoption of this technology. And your Department of Transportation here strongly supports that. And it wouldn't surprise me if they helped in this language somewhat. Um, Changing the tariff structure and adopting smart meters will enable the city to allow additional smart city technologies like traffic, weather, security uh, to em emerge utilizing yeah, other technologies to emerge utilizing city streetlights and right of way. So your, your city is on it and actually they're the only city in the state that has a pilot going right now testing the smart meter under investor owned utilities. So let's talk about municipally owned utilities and maybe some of the things that they're doing. The city of San Francisco is a municipally owned utility. It's called San Francisco um, what, Power Line or PUC, SFPUC. But they oversee their electricity uh, uh, like Santa Clara Power does. And their policy is adopted locally. And they're converting 18,000 of their streetlights to smart wireless controlled lights like San Jose is, but they put out RFPs for new technologies to go on to those street lights, and if San, Jose, uh, San Francisco staff want to dim lights, it's not a big issue with policymakers there. The, the lower the bill, the better, as long as it's safe, because the savings can go to other city services. In an 
investor-owned utility situation, the lower the bill isn't always better because there's less revenue coming in. Therefore, rates have to go up somewhere else. Um, they're, they're looking at gunshot um, monitoring technology. So if there is a loud, loud noise uh, through triangulation, there's sensors in the lights that can determine what block the noise came from. That can send an immediate signal to public safety dispatchers. And, and it does identify different types of noises. So it could uh, allow very quick response. Um, they, they included, um, of course, the opportunity to change lighting levels. We've already talked about that. They could go dimmer on uh, full moon nights, uh, brighter on special events like parades and festivals. Uh, they could flash them in the uh, need of an evacuation route. They could, they could actually even change their color if they put in a couple spare LEDs and needed to send a certain color out there as a, as a warning, um, some type of warning that all city residents might know about. Uh, in terms of uh, traffic counting, San Francisco is doing some unique things. Also, they're um, integrating their lighting system with transit safety. So as vehicles are coming down a street, the street light senses the vehicles are coming, and that will uh, increase lighting levels at nearby bus stops. So anytime a car is coming down at night, uh, a very uh, heavily used transit stop, for instance, might have a little bit brighter level light to make sure all those pedestrians that are darting across the street to catch that bus don't get struck. Uh, so they are, they are uh, in some ways, looking to uh, sense oncoming traffic, change level of light with tra near transit stops. Um, air quality sensors, uh, they're already, uh, actually San Jose is testing air quality sensors uh, through a, an agreement with PG&E. Uh, they were able to put additional load on uh, eight streetlights and they're testing air quality sensors uh, developed by Intel and another company. Uh, but other cities are uh, doing that as well. Uh, precipitation uh, or uh, rain gauge type uh, meters, I think precipitation, air quality, and other um, types of environmental data that's important to other agencies in a, in a region. Sure. Um, just to follow up on the transportation related stuff you talked about, uh, the sensors coming down the street and lighting things, are any of them looking at tying it into the actual traffic control, the traffic controllers so that they can sense throughput on a corridor and adjust, I don't know, almost in real time, yeah. the, what the street lights need to do based on other factors that are going on in the intersection. Okay. Well, not so much with the street lights, but with autonomous vehicles, I think that's, that's going to happen. Right now, your traffic signals um, uh, kind of uh, like are your ears and eyes, maybe, of vehicles coming, and they respond, they try to respond to a vehicle that's coming um, through detectors in the street. Your traffic signals signal of the future is going to be more than ears and eyes. They're going to have a voice and they're, they're going to be talking to the car and the car is going to be talking to the signal and a whole bunch of cars are going to be talking to the signal. And it will probably, in my view, be more of a direct link between oncoming autos, um, digital technology sensing pedestrians, um, all talking to a signal outside of today's uh, outdated technology. So motion of cyclists through very sophisticated type cameras um, that uh, can depict, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, we're talking a lot about trying to eliminate pedestrian fatalities in America. And the city of San Jose has passed a very, very uh, re well-respected um, document called Vision Zero. And this Vision Zero document on the San Jose website really talks about how San Jose is going to try to eliminate pedestrian and bicycle fatalities. And one of the things that they've realized is out of a lot of uh, a 
spike in pedestrian fatalities in the last couple of years, and there's some reasons why that's happening. Um, but because of this spike, we're studying and analyzing where these crashes are occurring with pedestrians. Normally, they're on wide streets like Winchester. They're at night, and which means it's dark, and they're mid-block. And they're running across traffic to either get to a, a convenience outlet, maybe, or to a bus, or they're just not, um, they could possibly be uh, uh, inebriated or under the influence, but they are crossing traffic. So the technology that we're looking at is pretty exciting. Um, if you have, um, like, character recognition digital technology that can study a whole zone of a street, mid-block, so maybe the light is just lighting up 50 feet. But the, the street light itself has more technology in it that's more common in phones like these. This kind of technology can start going up in the, in the air and coming back down and really detecting change. We could actually identify an, an abnormal event such as an east-west movement on a north-south street and send that signal to a dynamic sign, set of signs a thousand feet ahead that says pedestrians in roadway, or send it digitally through dedicated short range into the vehicle's dashboard through a, through a dedicated um, bandwidth that uh, the U.S. government has set up for pedestrian devices, infrastructure devices, phones, and other devices to talk to cars. It's called vehicle to infrastructure, or vehicle to vehicle. Put them on brakes. All, and you have automatic braking systems, uh, steering assist systems, and at some point in time, you know, the car may just take over completely to avoid the crash with the pedestrian. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a lot of technology companies are now working with the U.S. government uh, and uh, coming together like never before. Uh, all of your Silicon Valley companies uh, want a piece of that action uh, to help cities, mayors, governors, and uh, federal government to save lives. You know, we had uh, about 35,000 people killed last year you know, on our nation's highways, and about six or 7,000 of those were, uh, were pedestrians. That's a, that's a high, high percentage. And by the way, those pedestrian fatalities aren't happening out on the freeways. They're happening in our neighborhoods, our schools, and our dark, wide arterials at night. So yeah, sensing traffic, sensing pedestrians is going to be the wave of the future. Um, I wanted to also let you know that um, every one of your houses that has a smart meter on it now, if you were to go out and shine a flashlight on that meter tonight, you'll see a label on there that says it reads Silver Spring. Silver Spring happens to just be the name of the company that made the wireless uh, um, technical devices in the meter that allows pg e to wirelessly read your energy levels now instead of sending a meter reader out there to read it and get hit by a dog. Uh, PG&E's website, they just boast about all the money they're saving and the efficiency and the ability for you to save energy. I mean, it's just a big, to me, it's like a big love fest kind of <laughs> how proud they are of these smart meters and particularly how proud they are to work with Silver Spring. Well, Silver Spring is a Redwood City company. I'm proud to say and glad to say, as Pierre is nodding, yes, that they are they are moving to San Jose this year. Yay! Yeah. And um, they want to, they are already working with San Jose in putting their wireless meters on the photo in that photo cell um, on top of San Jose streetlights, and they are wirelessly calculating how much energy the San Jose streetlights are using. And there are every time San Jose dims, that lowers their bill. And then uh, at the end of a maybe a month or at the end of a quarter or the end of a fiscal year or something, the utility company and the city square up on okay, here's what you billed us, assuming it was a uh, an old photo cell, but here's what we actually use. Rebate us this money. So San Jose is actually in that that mode right now. Only 
only city in the state doing it. So is that getting around the tariff then? Because I know the tariff was kind of fixed. The tariff applies to every city in, ter in, in, in every city and county in the whole state where these three IOUs are, except for that pilot. And that's what it's called, a pilot. It was uh, September 2011 that P uh, CPUC approved the city of San Jose to enter into this type of program. Um, and another interesting thing is these big, um, Steve has a name for them, but I won't use that name, but these big poles that you're seeing popping up, up around city streets. Have you seen some of these big really fast street light poles? So uh, the city has actually entered into an agreement with Verizon, Phones, and Ericsson, manufacturers of cell phones. So Verizon and, Eric and Ericsson um, have equipment now inside of these new fat poles. And those are small cell cell phone coverage in San Jose through that, through the use of the new pole with the added space. But I will say that the transformer and the and the machinery that's down in this big base at the bottom of this pole, it, it's using a lot of electricity um, to run that stuff. But the wireless meter made by Silver Spring will wire, will use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, but a wireless connection down to the base of the pole to measure how much energy is being consumed by this non-conforming load. So the beauty of this is the city of San Jose can pay a streetlight bill for dimming. That energy is being monitored by the smart uh, meter by Silver Spring. <coughs> And Verizon and Ericsson can pay, pay their portion of the bill for all the electricity that they're utilizing on that pole. My dream and wish would be that we do other things on poles and use that as a perfect model to grow the pie. And I would, I would like to see, you know, uh, um, cities throughout California lead in that effort. And um, I'm testifying before the CPUC uh, next uh, on the 28th, on Thursday the 28th. City of San Diego's uh, request to put in um, wireless control lights. Now, why would I protest a city doing that? Because the city asked me to protest it. <laughs> I said, you're requesting to put in wireless control lights and you're protesting, you want me to put, yes, we do. And I read, I read the um, stipulations of San Diego Gas and Electric and they're only going to allow the city of San Diego to adjust their dimming level one time per year. They will not allow any power to be consumed outside of the presumed dusk to dawn photocell time. And if any power is shown to be tracked during that time, that light becomes disqualified from the pilot test. And they, San Diego Gas and Electric in their advice letter to the CPUC is raving how innovative and creative this is. Yet the very city that wanted it is now writing a protest because we want more, and we don't want to, here in 2016, they're referencing a 2011, a 2011 similar request by pg and &E in San Jose. It's just not the case. pg and &E in San Jose got a lot more latitude built into their system than what Gas and Electric is wanting to put on San Diego. So that's pretty much all I had to say. I did write a, let, uh, a paper last April. In New York at a light fair show, and it's called Streetlights Meet Internet of Things. And um, it talks about all those things that Steve and, and others of you have kind of talked about. What could we do on streetlight poles? And I, I would just say that your council, your, your departments, um, you may you, know, you may always believe that you know things turn slowly and and uh, they do sometimes, but. San Diego shoes, and we're, we're the only we're the only city in the pg e territory with one exception so far. So, 
Um, uh, I think we just need to stay true to that vision and keep uh, supporting greater use of our current infrastructure and get more city services and solutions uh, on existing uh, infrastructure uh, and investments wherever we can. Incidentally, every one of those smart meters on your houses, every one of them has formed the wireless mesh network that allows the street light then to become just another house <laughs> in the neighborhood to have various things on that street light, like your toaster or your washing machine. So the network is there. We don't even have to invest heavily in Wi-Fi and upgrades for communications because we're in a PG territory that's covered with wireless communications right now. So we need to take advantage of that, and that's what San Jose is trying to do, I think. And you can forward me the, those, those documents. I'll make sure we get reports on our website. Uh, Perfect. Absolutely. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what other kind of um, advantages do you see if we could bring 
fiber, you know, to do so. Well, San Jose has a pretty robust fiber network, city owned. Um, it, it pretty much extends out to all the traffic signals in the city. Is it right? Yeah. And at those locations, then there's gateways that then pick up local signals, um, and then the fiber becomes a backhaul for data for more. Um, City's copper communications and wire and fiber that uh, extend to every every traffic signal in the city. There's pretty good uh, fiber coverage in that regard. Um, Sa San Jose's standard plans for traffic signals. So if a new signal goes in, I believe we changed the standard several years ago that we pull fiber alongside of the wires under the streets to every corner and up every pole. So why is it I hit all thousand? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and we'll, we'll post up uh, the information that Jim referenced, the paper, and um, this, there's a city memo and, and a couple other things that he, he sent. We, I just got them yesterday. Um, so thank you again. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about this, we didn't get a chance to talk about this last uh, last meeting. To make sure I, uh, uh, we touch on this a little bit while, um, while the council member is here, because um, he spoke to us a, a, a couple times, and as well as the mayor did at the last WAG meeting. Um, but this is the concept pictures for what's called the Volmar. This is the one that you might have heard about uh, on 350 South Winchester. It's that little um, cut out of Santana Row that has that uh, you know little uh, strip of one or two story building right across. So just to put this in perspective, what you're looking at, this would... Uh, Kirk, can I step in here? Absolutely. I can run at 8 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I met with the family that owns the property. Uh, Federal Realty Santana Row wanted to buy it from them for several years. They didn't want to sell. Uh, it's a family from San Francisco. They own commercial property, and for them, it's what they own. They don't sell it. They own it. They pass it on to the next generation. It's 0.89 acres, less than an acre of land. It's zone commercial, but the city of San Jose allows something what's called a signature project under the general plan. If you will provide a certain amount of job space, retail office, high density if you're going to do housing, uh, provide unique architecture and open space, then you have the ability to submit what's called a signature project. We have had people come forward to submit signature projects in the past, and basically what they do is they put a quiz nose at the bottom, and they go, there you go. And, and that's not what we wanted. So this is actually the first project that's actually met the bar for signature because of 50,000 square feet on the bottom of retail office, then the 330 units up top, which is truly high density, uh, the open space. So square, which most people would do, maximize every square inch, they put a unique design that you've never seen ever in the city of San Jose, and frankly, you only see in some very exclusive large cities around the world. Uh, and that's what's proposed. So they're currently going through an environmental impact document, their environmental impact report, just like Santana West is, right? They have to see how many trips they'll generate of cars, all the things that go in an EIR be a community meeting on that. Um, one thing I want to talk about, San Jose approves two types of housing. We approve what's called market rate, which means whatever you're willing to buy it at the market price or rent it at the market price. And we build low income, which is restricted based on your income level. The developments of those are completely different. The low income property is exempted from property tax forever. The market rate property pays taxes every year, which goes to fund your public schools, it goes to fund your county health department, it goes 
to fund your city, etc. So there's an economic difference. In addition, historically, the low-income housing was away from paying the crimp and uh, excise tax, which went to paving roads, paving arterial roads, and Jim knows that, as well as it didn't pay fees for parks. So in this case, this project, as proposed, I know parks have been a topic here for a while. The only way you get a park is when you have residential development. You don't get it from an office because office doesn't pay park fees. Residential does. This will pay approximately $5 million in park fees. Pretty substantial amount. In addition, uh, it'll pay uh, annualized property tax just to the city, $450,000 a year. So that goes to start to fund the, uh, the wage of a fully compensated police officer, for example. Uh, on top of that, that's just a small portion. Your school district here would get somewhere to upwards of, uh, I do have to do the math, but somewhere about a million dollars a year. So when you build density, true density, it starts to actually generate money for the city to pay for the services. There's the ongoing, which is the property tax we've talked about. There's the one time, which is the $5 million in park fees. There's the multiple million dollars in those other fees that will go to paved roads that must be paved in the area. It'll also pay what's called the housing impact fee, which is a new fee that we put on uh, residential development in the city. So they'll pay for every square foot, they will pay roughly $17 to $20 a square foot, which will be $5 million towards paying for low-income housing. So they have to pay, which obviously increases the rent or the for sale price later, right, because they have to get it back. But these are all the things that this project generates. They're also talking about doing a restaurant on top, and this would also be public access. How many stories? 25. Um, and then you would go up, you would have public access to the top, and it would be an area where people could go to admire the view, etc. Is there an airport limitation? Or? Not here. There's, yeah, there is a limit of something, but not what you have in the downtown. So this would be, frankly, this would be a significant building as far as height alone. Um, so that's the proposed project. So 50,000 square feet of office, retail the bottom, multi-story residential on top, and with it comes all the fees, etc. Uh, with anything you build here, if you build a daycare center or you build this, you're going to generate traffic trips. So the question is, how many trips will it affect? And if you don't do, let's say, because what we typically do in San Jose is people go, it's too tall. It's just too tall. I can't, I can't look at it. Okay, fine. We'll take the 330 units, and instead of putting it on one acre, now you put it on six. And now you've lost six acres of land versus potentially doing it on one acre of land, leaving you more options for more jobs in San Jose or anything else. Inherently, any street, whether it's Winchester, Stevens Creek, uh, San Carlos, there's a vehicle capacity, right? There's only so many cars you can carry on the street. And once you get there, you sort of got to that point of saturation. So you can get there with slow cuts of bleeding, or you can get there with something very big and prominent and get something from it. It's two different ways of looking at it. So this will, you know, this will come forward. They're going to go through the whole process and come to city council, and that's the project. I'm quoted in the business journal as supporting the project, and I do because of the economic benefit, and I feel one way or the other, the, the units are going to come to Winchester, and it's just a matter, do you want it on one acre, or do you want it on 15 to 20 acres, which is eventually what will happen because every other parcel will develop over time. So this is that, and uh, I can't speak for them because I'm not them, but I, like I told you, I did meet with them. It's on my calendar. I met with the family and the architect, and they wanted to understand, you know, would this be something, you know, I would, uh, what was my sentiment on it? And I've always been very pro-identity, pro, and when I campaigned, I talked about identity, I talked about height, and I'm also very cognizant of the service requests residents have. And if you have the opportunity to build your city in an economically strong way, then this is the type of housing you do it. But guess what? It doesn't mean you build out Coyote Valley, which is the agriculture area between San Jose and Morgan Hill, with a bunch of single-family homes, because that's where we lose cash, because you have to then build a street infrastructure, a storm sewer infrastructure, a sanitary sewer infrastructure, all those 
those traffic lights or uh, street lights and traffic lights, etc. So this fits in. So that's police substation. Police substation, etc. So um, when these buildings all come out to, to us and other neighborhood groups, the big deal always is neighborhood parking, right? So when you got a situation like this, and we know the rule from planning, you right? Like one and a half parking places, exactly for every three bedroom apartment or whatever it is. Six people live there, but you only have one and a half cars. I don't know how they thought of that, but maybe Jim. There's a, there's a whole formula in Jim Helmer to talk about that we had more time. Jim Helmer invented that formula. I have the other half of that parking. <laughs> but let me just say, yeah. you got something like this. Now is the time to change that parking rule so it's reasonable, mm -hmm. so that you don't have one and a half parking places per unit, and, and you don't have this big fight with the neighbors on and on. Well, on it's, it's, on. A, it's an argument that is made every time. I just admire the pizza, but, 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 mushroom. Wait, wait, wait. wait. But I'm, I'm with you. But it doesn't make a difference whether it's this project, the daycare center, Jack in the Box. There's never enough parking. Some place. Never have, enough. Some place you have to draw, uh, like George Bush said, you know what, put a line in the sand, right? Some place we got to change that rule because it's not working. So the rules are set up to provide property owners some certainty, and they're done on some level of statistical analysis to say the average number of cars owned by square footage in apartments. Because you can't say you have to have uh, one car for every bedroom because that doesn't work out, right? Now, some people, because the state of California doesn't allow us to restrict how many cars can be in a household because that would be discriminatory based on how people form families. So you know some people might be your neighbor, right? Steve, you might my neighbor, you know he's got seven cars. There's two driving adults there, right? But he's a collector. Versus some people though, they might only have one car that's shared. So that's why you get these funky things like 1.5 or etc. This project, based on the square footage and number of units, they provided to the to the T the number of parking spaces right. that the planning department requires. Right. Now it's clearly acceptable for the environmental for you to say, I think they should provide more parking. We have enough developments going on in San Jose and other places that you have historical data that tells you that if you have 650 units, okay, you're going to have that many cars on average. So your concerns are there's, there's not enough parking. You take, you take a look at Can it. Can I summarize this? Because I, I can't stay the whole night. Right. Would, would you say your main concerns are this is 25 stories or 20 stories, there's not enough parking. The one and a half unit rule is, is not enough. So your, your, your issue is the whole city's ratio of parking to housing unit, in your view, it's too low. Correct. Got it. Okay. Yes? Uh, two or three questions. Yeah. Is this in your district or Chapman? It's in my district on the Santana Road side. Okay. Do you have a, any reading on how Santana Road feels about it? They are in favor. They are well, uses up their traffic capacity, it means Santana Road can develop less, right? But in this case, they haven't challenged the project. Okay. We'll more shopping. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is unique because if you live in this thing, you might be working at Splunk yeah. a year from now. You might be shopping across the street at the new grocery store. So there's, there's arguments made both ways. Okay. And then a little bit about the technology thing. We sat in another meeting about uh, about the hoses strung across uh, Stevens Creek Boulevard, mm -hmm. and they're using data from four or five years ago to make predictions about the impact of different projects on Winchester, and the intersections are scoring like F level. Uh, well, I think I was in a presentation, they were C. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I think some of them, like the Monroe yeah. uh, intersection is a, a level F. Right. Uh, uh, several intersections are right. just... Yes, yes, yes. And, um, you know, of course, traffic is going to be a consideration. You know, I, I'm always struggling with the fact that, uh, you know, I live here in San Jose. Right, right. I own four elderly care homes, yep. as you know, and I'm paying tremendous property taxes. Which we only get about 12 to 14 percent. My next door neighbors are paying because they bought, you know, I'm post prop 13. Yeah. They're paying, you know, 11, 1200. Right. I'm paying
representing a new generation, uh, we're looking at, we're talking about things like rent control. I, I believe that uh, in a market economy, when you can build enough supply, then you can meet the demand, and then uh, rents don't have to just skyrocket. But if you suppress supply, yeah, the demand. Sure. Going towards vision 2040 of 400,000 new residents. Right. Where is he going to be able to find an affordable place uh, in the future? And so, you know, a lot of us have a vested interest because we're old time homeowners who've gotten our, our piece of the pie, a single family house sure. in the burbs. But, um, you know, I think we really do have to consider the next generation. You know, we shouldn't just be so selfish, personally. Well, I was, I was speaking to a Cub Scout group today. These kids were in elementary school, and they talked, asked me about my job, and I said, well, you know, I, I, this, this, and I said, well, some of the stuff I vote on may not be built in the case of housing. It may take 15 years to build it. And you know what? That might be housing that you occupy, because San Jose, the existing population, is going to create about 240 to 250,000 babies. You just had one left? And there, and then some of those kids are going to live here, and you're not going to build housing tracks like you did in the past. If you've got a single-family home, consider yourself lucky and fortunate. It'll continue to rise in value because we're not building those anymore. Everything else with the land that's left is high density. So, I mean, so that's where that is. Uh, yes, Daphne. Um, high density is not bad when you've got infrastructure to handle. Seems like the city, city council, planning commission, they're all ignoring the parts of the, the EIRs that basically state can't mitigate this just for straight forward. Yeah. We know that it's gonna be bad, it's gonna be awful. But it's an acceptable well, level. Well no, I mean some of them say they're not acceptable levels and we're just ignoring that. Well, acceptable to the council because they still pass it. I've been on the council it's my well, tenth year. I've I never know. seen a residential project on land that's owns residential ever defeated. Right, I know.
this one, Santana West, when you look at the square footage and total type of thing, but this is will be a meeting once the draft is out. There'll be, but you'll have everyone have the ability to comment via being at a meeting verbally or emails, etc. At the at the WAG meeting, which was just I don't know it was last week or a week, a week ago, um, Mayor Ricardo brought this up, um, and I think we were at the meeting. Uh, he didn't seem real. So 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 sell this off to Barry Swenson. And Barry Swenson comes back and goes, I'm entitled. I'm not going to build that. I'm going to build a concrete, you know, military-looking structure there because I can go it. Uh -uh. We're going to make sure it's down to the detail of the color, the glass, the material. So if it, if it comes to council, that's exactly what it'll look like. It won't be a fantasy story. It'll be that. It'll be what it'll be. So, yes? Uh, well, one thing in favor is I think it, it looks really cool. Star Trek. <laughs> I mean, it, it is unique, right? It's like art, right? Art it, it, Everyone is put it on your little postcards of San Jose. You know? <laughs> I mean, you've seen plenty of other buildings that are just squares and rectangles. This is something completely different we haven't seen. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You just mentioned something. Uh, you said that they would be paying uh, like a traffic impact fee. Yes. So when you're leaving or coming in, it's 
a system they have in Germany that they have installed all over the world, so it'll be self-parking. Now, whether it's enough parking, to your question, always open for debate. But that's the project as proposed. You know, community meeting once the draft EIR is out, and everyone will be invited. It'll be a big party, and all that jazz. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> that was more than I expected to be able to cover. Thank you very much for sharing. Now I get to go I, to I, my I, girlfriend. I appreciate that a lot. Please apologize yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the next thing, uh, so anybody else uh, want to touch on anything that's, that's good for now? Because I, I don't want to keep us. Can I make a comment? Yes, real quick. Um, so I was, at, I was at planning last week for the Winchester Advisory Group.
not they do because of just the native born population. So we're going to live through a lot of dramatic change and probably feel a lot of the pain one way or another. And some of us will choose to get up and, and leave. My wife and I talk about that. Where can we go get five acres and just be quiet out in the, you know, wherever? Um, and some people will adapt and change. And perhaps some might be thinking, I'm going to live in the Star Trek building. <laughs> and that's great, too. Um, but I think that's just kind of where we are in this place right now. We, we have to some, degree, to some degree, I think, come to grips with that and say, all right, is the conversation about what we're going to live with for the next five or ten years, or is the conversation about something else? And we can we can argue with that, and we'll argue over it, I think, we will debate it, but um, I, I think that population is just going to drive things. And, and the last thing I'll say is that a number of people have written to me or commented and said, well, say no more growth. Um, and it's an interesting prospect, but it, that only works if we say to Apple, Intel, Facebook, and all the other technology companies, we don't want you here. You can't add employees. People can't have children. You can't, I mean, you can't do these things. So if we want to shut everything down, we won't grow. But that's yeah, not or, realistic. Or you, or you can't live long. Good morning. 
nine eight to two. Um, read up on it. We're we're, we're gonna uh, we'll circulate that as part of the minutes at the end. Uh, I'll, I'll wear the link. To, I was gonna put a link on here, but there's not enough space. Or, there's ten seats. All right, there's, there's ten seats. So that's that's how we got to fifteen hundred uh, uh, with a grant from Chappie. It's it's thousand dollars. So ten seats. There's about five of them already spoken for. So if you're interested in that, we want to make it available to Winchester NAC members as a priority. Um, but it is going to be a hundred dollars a ticket. So it's not a free ticket. It's just a reduced rate ticket. Okay. And so who are the speakers? And so there's. I, I will. I will send a, a link in, in, in the messaging to, so you can go in. It's it's a pretty good collection of folks. So. Oh, God. Just let us 